I, I really do appreciate the fact that Scott didn't pass judgment on the wisdom of the decision we made when we uh, passed our campaign goal to double the goal just before the economy went down. So, I, you know, I, sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and say that was really a smart thing to have done. We should have just declared success and gone home, but we, uh, we chose not to and we continue to move forward. I had forgotten we had reached a five-year time period. Regents has been wonderfully supportive, and uh, I hope over the course of that five years, those of you who have been, who have been regular attenders have come to better understand some of the great contributions that Scott referred to that are being made at Utah State University. It's uh, almost without exception that when we have visitors from other states, from other universities across the country that come and spend a bit of time with us, that by the time they leave our campus, and I had this happen twice this last week, first with a group of, of presidents of international institutions, and then yesterday with an individual that uh, we may attract an exciting program to Utah State University that, that uh, he manages. Almost without exception, they will say, gosh, I didn't realize Utah State University is as good as it is. And so it's a great institution, and we're very proud of it. We're particularly proud today of the, the wonderful partnership that we have with Regents and the opportunity that really has allowed us to expose a growing number of individuals to the work that's being done at the institution. I'll be very brief. I want to just mention the importance of the program that you will learn more about today to our institution. Uh, Doug will say more about this, but uh, the Space Dynamics Lab this year will celebrate its 50th anniversary. It's a grand anniversary. We look forward to having a great celebration later in the fall. But this part of the Utah State University program has been one of our great success stories. And in a time when the economy is, is struggling, and we all know it's struggling, to be able to look at, at this part of our program and see not just the uh, historical success, but the outstanding, exciting future that we have ahead of us. A, a program that uh, has resulted in opportunities for our students that are unlike anything that happens anywhere else in the country. I'm sure Dr. Lemon will mention this. One of the things that we, we love to talk about is the fact that we have had more student-developed experiments go up with the space shuttle than is true for any other university in the world. And so it's not just the quality of the research that is engaged in by our research faculty, but the opportunity for students, undergraduate and graduate students, to be directly engaged in that process. And so we're excited. Uh, a few months ago, we had the tremendous opportunity to go through a, a national search for a new director of our Space Dynamics Lab. Uh, outstanding candidates, but one of those candidates emerged as, as clearly the strongest the individual that will lead us uh, to even new heights with our Space Dynamics program. And so I'm excited to introduce you to, to Dr. Doug Lemon, who is director of our Space Dynamics Lab, and we'll look forward to what you have to share with us today, Doug. Well, thank you. Thank you, President Albrecht, and thanks to each of you for being here this morning. It's great to be part of Utah State University again. Uh, my mother was uh, on the faculty at the university, and my earliest memories go back to Utah State, and I'm pleased to be associated with the university. Pleased to be here with my wife, Alice May, and uh, two of my sons who are fourth-generation Aggies, so uh, we bleed blue in our house. Over the more than 100 years of Utah State's existence, it has really distinguished itself in many areas of science, engineering, arts, education, and other areas. But as the president said, one of the areas of distinction is the Space Dynamics Laboratory. And it's really an amazing story how this could happen, how in a kind of remote valley in northern Utah, almost two hours from a major airport, not near a major NASA center, how this came to be, how this world-class organization arose. And as interesting as that story is, you can relax. I'm not going to tell you that story. Uh, what I am going to tell you is about impact, the impact that, U that Utah State and the Space Dynamics Laboratory is having on issues of national importance. The first of those is discovery. From the earliest days, mankind's been driven to discover. It may have been to find out what was beyond the next mountain, what was across the continent, or over the ocean, and then out into space. And I believe that with each advancement of discovery has come a greater awareness of where we've already been. I know in my life I had a great moment of self-discovery when I saw that picture. I think many did. When we saw the fragile, beautiful, living, breathing Earth against the blackness of space, it gave me a greater sense of the stewardship we bear for managing our planet. A second interest, national security. 
You don't have to read the paper or listen to the news very long until you realize we live in a dangerous world, whether it's rogue states or non-state terrorists or international cyber criminals. There are people who would do us harm. And we have to protect the foundation of security that, that brings, brings happiness and the liberties that we enjoy so much today. And finally, there's concern about the planet itself. We know that the Earth has changed over its thousands and millions of years of existence. There are long-term trends and short-term trends. We need to understand those and understand the impact that humans are having with our activities on the future of the Earth. One theme that's common to all of these is that of sensing, of making measurements that give quantitative information about what's really happening, how we can respond and make a difference to bring about the outcomes that we desire. So that's what I want to talk about today. And sensing and measurement is the really foundation of the first pillar of our mission. And that is to build instruments. We build uh, satellite instruments, military hardware that sense and make measurements. The second part of our mission statement is the important role we play with our clients. We like to work with our clients from the earliest part of the technology, the mission planning, understanding the needs and requirements through development and then on into execution of the mission. And being part of the university, we're very proud of the third part of our mission, and that is supporting education of scientists and engineers. That commitment begins with those that work for us, and it extends to those who may work for us, or someone, someday. I have a, a strong commitment to education of future scientists and engineers because I think it's so important to the future and competitiveness of this country. So a few more facts about SDL. As President Albrecht mentioned, we're celebrating our 50th year this month. Not many companies can say they've been in space 50 years because Sputnik was 51 years ago. Our revenues are just over $50 million a year and somewhat over 400 employees. We're very pleased that 135 of those employees are students. This gives them an opportunity to put into practice the things they're learning at school and gives them an opportunity to, to earn a living. We've estimated that over the 50 years of SDL's existence that over 1,500 students have worked there. Now that statistic is especially important to me and my wife because I was one of them. Back when I was an undergraduate in physics in the 70s, um, I had that opportunity to work a couple of summers at SDL and it gave me a chance to see the application of what I was learning and a chance to support our family. We've put many satellites and missions into space measured in the hundreds. We have beautiful state-of-the-art facilities located in North Logan. But let's go back to those national needs. Sense. Now. Any faculty by which information about the physical world is obtained. The ability to perceive and be motivated by principles. A feeling derived from multiple or subtle impressions. The ability to make intelligent decisions or sound judgments. An opinion arrived at through reflection or perception. Verb, to perceive something or somebody. To understand something intuitively. To detect and identify a change in something.
So let's look at the first challenge, that of discovering more about the universe. To do that, we have to look to the past. If we want to understand our Earth and our solar system, we need to look at the evolution and the history of others. Astronomy, like many sciences, we learn to be able to predict more about, the, understand the present and predict more about the future by looking to the past. Archaeologists, for example, learn about the rise and fall of ancient civilizations by studying ruins and artifacts. And the deeper they dig, the older the civilization they uncover. And that much is the same is true in space, except the astronomer's shovel is the telescope, coupled with the speed of light. Now let me explain what I mean. The light that we see from the moon every night leaves the moon about one second before we see it. The light we see from the sun each morning leaves the sun about nine minutes before it gets here. The light from the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, has left there about four years ago before we see it in the night sky. And light takes 100,000 years to go edge to edge of the Milky Way. Because the universe is expanding, the oldest objects are the farthest away. So to see, we can see the past. It's there before us every night, if we can only see it. We know the space telescope Hubble has been in the news lately because it got a refurbishment and a life extension. And it's enabled us to look 13 billion years back in time because it's able to look so far out into space. We can learn a lot about the universe with our eye, looking at the visible wavelengths that we can see with our eye. We can learn a lot more by looking at other wavelengths. This is an image of what the Milky Way would look like if we could see in the infrared, the wavelengths just longer than the, the red light we're able to see. This in image was taken by the Spirit 3 instrument developed by Space Dynamics Laboratory and created a lot of scientific and defense information but gave this beautiful view of the Milky Way. The instrument we're developing most recently is called WISE. Now I know what you're thinking. George Lucas does not work for us, and this is not R2-D2's big brother. <laughs> it's actually a telescope sitting inside that white vessel that's the cryostat that keeps it cold, and the uh, silver dome on the top will be jettisoned into space and opening the telescope to the star field. We've just completed this instrument. It's been shipped from uh, our facility to Colt Boulder, Colorado, where it's been integrated onto the space uh, platform. It'll go to Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, later this fall for a November launch. What WISE will do is make a map of the star field that's hundreds of times more sensitive than anything ever done before. The James Webb Space Telescope is the successor to the Hubble, and it will be launched in a few years. And this instrument will create the atlas of things for it to study. Let me tell you how sensitive this is. Because it's looking for very, very cool objects, such as brown dwarf stars and things with a very low heat signature. If you could take an object the size of a postage stamp at room temperature in space and put this instrument 5,000 miles away, it will sense the heat from that stamp. It would see a small child hovering near the moon, although I wouldn't want to do that. Um, as I said, the, the, far, the most distant objects we can see are harder to see. And so we need larger and larger mirrors to collect the light in order to, to make them detectable. The next generation of Hubble was the James Webb Space Telescope. You can see here, this is a mock-up of the instrument being developed today, and it'll be launched in a few years. SDL is manufacturing the thermal links and technologies to move heat away from these uh, electronics and away from the, uh, the cold uh, uh, focal planes that make the, actually make the sensor measurements. We're very pleased that we were able to spin off a company, Thermal Management Technologies, earlier this year, headed by Dr. Claire Batty, who's with us today, along with his wife, Karen. And some of you perhaps heard him speak here at this session just a few months ago. We're very proud of that accomplishment and very pleased with the progress that they're making. So let's move on to the second threat, that of the national security. And that really comes in two forms. There's the threat from the sky and the threat on the ground. Thinking about the threat in the sky. The threat is really the missile coming over the horizon. You can see this little, our diagram of a missile trail and a little warm object coming at you at 17,000 miles per hour. At that speed, you only have a few minutes to detect that and do something about it. And you don't want to be wrong. And there was this driver for missile defense that was one of the real driving forces behind the formation of the Space Dynamics Laboratory. The Spirit 3 instrument I mentioned a moment ago that created that red map of the uh, Milky Way galaxy this is the instrument we developed a few years ago. It was created to really definitively prove whether or not infrared sensors could, in fact, detect missiles during their, their flight around the, around the Earth. In fact, it was, did that successfully, and there have been two generations of infrared satellites 
put in orbit for the purpose of missile defense uh, today. The third generation is being built today. We're not building the sensors ourselves, but we, they will be brought to our facility for calibration before they go into orbit. By calibration, it's really a matter of understanding exactly what that sensor gives you in terms of output relative to the input. We, uh, we deal with sensor calibration every day. It's the thermometer on our oven, the uh, speedometer on our car, or the all-important bathroom scale. And I, uh, I always like my scale better than the ones in the doctor's office, but uh, we'll argue that about calibration. But calibration is one of the real strengths of SDL and an area we really pioneered for the scientific community. There's always a place for the large satellites, but there's more and more interest in small satellites because they can be developed at a lower cost, they can be done quickly and put into orbit with much, uh, much uh, less difficulty. Another thing that small satellites can do is they can give you distributed measurements. If you want to understand, understand the global changes in the atmosphere over a few hundred kilometers, you can't do that with a single point measurement. You have to get a distributed measurement of the, of the environment. And we're able to do that with a constellation of satellites put into space, whether it's for missile defense or Earth studies. So I think these guys just have a great job. I figure these are the guys who grew up building spaceships with their Legos. I know my boys did. And so now they get to come to work and build spaceships uh, in, the, in the office. Uh, just to give you a reference, the Hubble is about the size of a school bus. The satellite I showed you is six or seven feet tall, about the size of a small car. And these satellites are about the size of a loaf of bread. And so within that, we do all the sensors, the electronics, the optics, the processing, the solar panels, all have to be condensed into that very small object. And sometimes they can get a ride into space sort of alongside with a, a larger mission, and we can get things done much more quickly. Everything we do at uh, Space Dynamics is not hardware. We do some software development. Uh, we've developed a tool called SensorCAD that's a computational tool that lets us do computationally the complete simulation of a threat scenario. It'll simulate the plume of a missile, the heat signature of the Earth, uh, the image of a, of a battlefield. Uh, we can image the atmosphere and all the transmission and physics of the transmission of uh, energy through the atmosphere and all the physics of the sensor itself, and the optics, the mirrors, the lenses, and the actual uh, focal plane array. Uh, this will be a, our first commercial product. We'll be on the market with a partner uh, here in August or September, and we're very optimistic about the benefit that'll have in the space world as well as our military forces overseas. So the future of, uh, of threat detection in the sky, as I said, it's about smaller, faster, cheaper payloads. We have to reduce the time from, to create a satellite from years to weeks. This is a huge change of paradigm. You can't do the same thing faster. You have to do different things. And SDL is right in the middle of that uh, paradigm change in how we do satellites. Let's shift to the threat on the ground. If you're a soldier on the ground in a conflict such as Iraq or Afghanistan, you want to know who's out there and what they're doing. So we have developed a number of systems to support the warfighter. This one's called iPod. Now, this is not the iPod you use to listen to music. This is iPod that you use to see. This little sensor underneath the, the small aircraft is about 25 pounds. It has a visible and a near-infrared sensor so it can see at night and is able to create imagery of the targets on the ground. Besides its lightweight, it's significant in that it has control software that compensates for the, the uh, knows exactly where it is in space, and it con compensates for the roll pitch uh, and the jitter of the aircraft. So it does this real-time compensation so it gets very accurate pictures uh, to the ground. These images have to be managed by software. Uh, Vantage is a software tool that we've developed uh, that's used around the world today by the military forces. It takes these images from air platforms, puts them into a mosaic picture, enables real-time collaboration. It may be a soldier on a battlefield, someone on aircraft carrier, someone in the Pentagon can look at this imagery, make decisions, and execute their mission. Of course, where there's software, there's hardware. They have to run on something. And you, you saw this image in the video that, that I showed earlier. These are the, the TAR systems, this airborne reconnaissance system. That's used in Iraq today. We send the staff to Iraq about twice a year uh, to the battleships, um, not to the battle zones, but uh, to safe areas where they can do maintenance and upgrade. But this is making a real difference to our troops today in their ability to, uh, to manage imagery and, uh, and execute their mission safely. So what's the future in this arena? Again, it's about sensors, more sensors, more information and data to understand the situation around them. One of these that we're pursuing is uh, imaging radar, sometimes called synthetic aperture radar, where you can 
create an image of the ground using radar waves, and they have the advantage of being able to work at night, work through clouds, or work through light tree cover. So they're a very valuable tool that we're trying to develop miniature uh, synthetic aperture radar, and we have tests uh, going on today that are um, really making a difference in our threat uh, scenario uh, detection. Another system called hyperspectral sensors. That's simply a fancy word for meaning many colors. That instead of the sensor giving you an image in just, say, uh, three bands, they may give you hundreds of bands or colors in the image. What that lets you do is better discriminate the target. So you can tell if that's a, a friendly object or some building versus an adversary or some target of military interest. So we're developing, again, very small miniature sensors for these hyperspectral measurements. Then there's video. Everyone wants video because it's simple, it's fast, and it gives you good information about motion. All of those, though, push the computing resources. The advent of multi-core computing is being exploited to process all this. Now, what I mean by that is the kind of computers that are in the, the Xboxes and Playstations. This has been a shift. Normally, uh, military investments push technology, and then they mature, and they make their way into the civilian community. This has been different. It's really the games players, the, the Xbox and the Playstations, that have pushed the computing technology, and that's now finding its way into science and military applications. People like all the names, IBM, Intel, NVIDIA, are um, working in this real generation shift in, uh, in computing that we're taking advantage of, as well as SDL. So let's go um, to the last change, the global climate change and what's going on. Again, here the need is to understand what's happening, getting quantitative measurements, so we know what's the cause, what's the effect, and how these interact. Before we talk about systems, let's get our bearings physically. You can see the curvature of the Earth here. That's about an 8,000 mile diameter of the Earth. See so where this image gets whiter and whiter to about right here. That's the edge of the Earth. This little thin band, that's the atmosphere. It's about 65 miles deep. It's considered the edge of space. That's an hour's drive in a car. Of course, it's harder in a spaceship. Um, but the point is that without the atmosphere, there is no Earth as we know it. We would look like Venus, and we know what that's like. So the, the dynamics that take place in that very thin layer as it interacts with the oceans, the Earth, and with mankind is, of course, of utmost importance to our future. We've developed a number of instruments over the years to understand the atmosphere and its changes. This one's called SOFI that studies these high ice-like uh, clouds in the atmosphere. And the, the nature of those clouds are changing. And this instrument was designed to understand the drivers of that change and how it's the chemistry of the atmosphere. It just completed two years on orbit, successfully fulfilling its design lifetime. We hope it'll work for many more years and give important information about changes in the atmosphere. Now, I know this, this also looks like another George Lucas creation, some animal over here trying to eat this metal box. But it's, uh, we call this um, instrument saber, not lightsaber, just saber. But uh, it's really to make measurements of the atmosphere over the solar cycle. The internal processes of the sun as it pushes energy from its two or three million degree core out to the surface, it takes about 11 year cycle. It varies of just a very small amount over that 11 years. And of course, our atmosphere responds to that change as it receives that energy. So this instrument saber was used to understand and make uh, measurements of the chemistry over that 11-year cycle. It was designed for two years of operation. It's just starting its eighth year of operation. And scientists are hopeful that the uh, system will operate through a full 11-year solar cycle. And this is a real uh, evidence of the quality of engineering done at SDL, that this system, really designed for two years, we hope will last 11 years, because it has cryocoolers and momentum wheels and things that are moving parts that, that do wear out. But we hope it will really give the first ever scientific uh, baseline of the complete solar cycle. Another instrument we've developed uh, is called FIRST. It's a balloon-borne instrument. And it measures the heat balance. Every day, the, sun gets nor the Earth receives enormous energy from the sun we hope we radiate exactly that same amount back into space. If we don't, we warm up. Of course, that's what drives the concern over greenhouse gases, is the trapping of that radiation before it can be radiated back into space. This instrument measures that heat balance, how much the Earth gets in, how much it radiates back, to understand what's really happening. This is currently in Colorado, undergoing tests at high altitude there. Uh, this instrument and several of our staff will go to high mountains in Chile later this year uh, for atmospheric testing and measurements, uh, all sponsored by NASA. So looking to the future, what's uh, NASA's very concerned about uh, climate change, the atmospheric studies. 
one of, they have a 10-year roadmap of missions that they'll be putting into space. The first of those, and one of greatest interest to us, is called Clario. Clario is designed to make the definitive map of Earth temperature. It will really put scientific data behind the question of is the Earth heating or cooling, and evidence as to why. What it will do is it'll make a map of the temperature of the Earth at every square kilometer at a tenth of a degree Kelvin accuracy for many, many years. That's a very challenging uh, prospect. We're involved with NASA in many of the precursor activities, such as error analysis and development of onboard calibration standards. Uh, we hope to win a major role in development of that uh, sensor, uh, which will be uh, launched in about 2015. So these are multi-year missions, and it's just on the front end, and I, I hope we, we get a major program to do that. So I've talked today about national needs and the important role of sensing and measurements, about discovery, about um, security and defending and securing our country, about uh, climate change and the planet itself. We know there are other needs that we're facing. We're, we're constantly, every day, facing the, the dual twins of the modern age, energy and environment. So we're actually applying our techniques and capabilities to new, uh, new challenges, whether it's uh, aerosol and wind characterization, air and water management, uh, battery technology for transportation and biofuels. We certainly have the sense of possibilities of things we can do as part of Utah State University in partnership with our colleagues on campus to make a difference to additional challenges facing the country. As we said, we're facing our 50th year of uh, anniversary, and we have a sense of excitement about another 50 years of impact uh, on Utah and the nation and the world. Now, I, I hope that 50 years from now, President, when you and I have both moved on, that some future director of Space Dynamics Laboratory is invited to this meeting to talk about the first 100 years of SDL's accomplishments. It's interesting to think that if the age patterns of directors kind of holds to the future as it has in the past, that that person's alive today. He or she's a student in grade school somewhere learning about science and math and engineering. So it just interests me how he or she will get interested in science through their parents, through their teachers and colleagues. Uh, I hope, President, that they have a chance to work at the SDL when they're a student at Utah State University. I think that would be a fine thing. However that happens and whoever that person is, I'm confident that uh, he or she will report on 100 years of significant impact on, on space, on environment, on energy, important questions to our lives that they will continue the tradition of excellence at Utah State. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, I'd be pleased to take some questions. Uh, Eric will bring you a microphone, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. And if I can, I have staff members here who can. So. I have two questions. One is, uh, you, you mentioned that the outer edge of the universe is where the oldest material is. That presupposes, I guess, that, that there's not material being created now, or planets well, aren't being created, or suns are not being created, or whatever the material is. Yeah, it's because the universe is expanding, and the, the objects that are going the fastest are then the farthest away, because it's expanding in all directions. So. It's just that the light has, traveled, has to travel so far that to us they look new, when in fact it's taken 13 billion years. They're, they're as old as we are, because we all started at the Big Bang. We all got the same start, right? But they're so far away that the light we see is 13 billion years old. So we sort of get to look into their past because that light's out there in space. Their history is still traveling through space to get to us. And then the second question, you said the... Um I guess the SABER is, is uh, focusing on the changes in the 11-year solar cycle. Right. Is, is the sun always on an 11-year cycle and it doesn't change? Is it like our seasons here upon the yeah, Earth? Yeah, it's, it's, it's measurable and you yeah. see certain things happening during that cycle? Right. It's, it's just a few percent, maybe even a fraction of a percent, change in its luminosity. Its intensity changes. And for reasons we don't fully understand, it's 11 years. And it goes up and down in a very repeatable pattern. And so that affects the Earth a bit in terms of the energy input that, this, that it hits the Earth every day, right. Yes. I think that NASA's funding for space research has not kept up with inflation. 
Are there other sources of funding for the work that you're doing? You have an amazing array of things that are very expensive. Yeah. Is NASA's portion of the research budget shrinking composed, compared to all that you're doing? Well, I know NASA has just received in this current budget a $2 billion plus up, so I think they went from 17 to 19 billion. Uh, the Obama administration has asked them to fast track the 10-year decadal survey. They asked them to move down to seven or eight years. Uh, and I think there's some shift toward the Earth sciences. Uh, there's a debate, debate whether you study the sun, whether you study the Earth, or whether you go into space, go to the moon or go to Mars. Um, so, you know, that's a budget that um, is getting some attention, obviously, and, and we, we, we get funds from NASA. Uh, from NOAA, who kind of tends to operate the satellites once NASA develops them, as well as the, uh, the defense organizations. That's pretty well the only players. Mm -hmm. But we have been, uh, we've been on a bit of a growth curve. We've been able to grow about 35 full-time staff this year, and we expect to do about the same next year, so our business is good. Other questions? Yes, up front here, Eric. But just, just a moment, let him get you a microphone. I'd like to know if, if you feel like there is life on other planets and other parts of our solar system. <laughs> question is, do I think there's life on other planets? I, I would say not in our solar system. I think our solar system is a very harsh place. We know enough about that. Other, yeah, I think there's life on other planets, sure. I really do, yeah. Personal opinion of mine? Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. There's no evidence of that scientifically, but I believe that, so. Then I'm an optimist, so who knows? Question in the back. Climate change has been in the news an awfully lot lately, and I was wondering if uh, in your space dynamic laboratory, do you just develop the instruments to measure all of that, or do you also analyze that data, and what, what uh, conclusions have you drawn? On what, relative to what was the first part of the question? The climate change. Oh, the climate change. Um, we, we do some analysis of the SDL, but we're mostly an instrument developers. Uh, we team with our colleagues on campus, uh, mostly in the upper atmosphere and space, uh, space weather kinds of things. Uh, we don't have any in-house analysis related to climate change, not, not really at, at Utah State or at, at SDL so much. Question in the back. Eric, to your right, or here. Doug, could you comment on... Um the change of administration, the appointment of a new NASA director, how it's affecting this type of research in general and SDL specifically? Um, we haven't really seen the impact of the new director yet. Um, we have seen the impact of the administration, and we might expect that new director will reflect the administration's priorities. What we see there is a shift in interest toward the earth sciences, perhaps in deference to other subjects, the interest in global climate change and understanding the atmosphere and dynamics, I think we'll, we'll get a uh, continued emphasis from this administration. And as of the new administrator, I guess time will tell. So we don't know yet. A question here. Uh, oh, yes, a note here from my colleague, uh, Ned Weinschenker, um, who's on our board and works with us on the, relative to the U-STAR. Um, relative to our interest in energy, we have created a new uh, sister laboratory, the Energy Dynamics Laboratory, and received word yesterday that we received a $500,000 grant to uh, help us jumpstart our uh, journey into energy. So perhaps a year or two, President, the director of EDL, can come to this breakfast and talk about energy environment. So we really appreciate the state. If there's anyone here from the state, from USTAR, our, our deepest thanks for that. And I see a Kent coming toward the front. That must be a signal that we're... Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Lemon for his fantastic presentation and his colleagues. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Doug will be with us if any of you have questions that we didn't get to and we've got some time for him to answer your questions offline here. Uh, we'd like to make a couple of uh, quick announcements. First of all, I want to thank again Scott Ideson, his colleagues at Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield. They make all of this possible and we're excited to have the opportunity to present these to you. It couldn't happen if it weren't for our partnership with Regents, so thank you very much.
if you got a parking uh, card when you came in, all you have to do at the exit booth is tell them that you're with Utah State University and the gates will open and you're out on your own. <laughs> We've taken care of parking for you. Uh, watch your email for announcements of our upcoming events. We'll be back again in the fall. Uh, and it seems to have worked pretty well because we've got a great group today. Uh, I've flooded some of your inboxes with my emails and we're grateful for those of you who've passed those on to colleagues. Listen, before we break, I want to... Um, just mention one quick thing. Uh, in these past five years of Sunrise Sessions, we've met a lot of geniuses uh, in our presenters, but the genius behind the events has actually been uh, my colleague, Patty Halafia, who, among all the other things she does for us, has really been the motivating force behind keeping these events on track. Um, I don't think I'm premature in announcing this, that a, uh, uh, a really great move for Utah State University, for all of those of you who are Aggies and all of those who are honorary Aggies, um, that uh, my colleague Patty has been named the new executive director of the Utah State University Alumni Association. And I cannot imagine a better person qualified. Patty, would you stand? <laughs> This really is a great day for Utah State and a great step forward, and we're honored to work with her in every capacity, especially this new one. With that, we thank you for your participation. We're grateful to you for coming. Uh, thank you for being involved in this, and we'll see you next time at our Sunrise Sessions.